Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well. My name is Michael Raimondo. I'm your host this evening on behalf of Whale Coast Conservation. So thank you for joining us from all over the world. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is the fifth in our series of uh, sharing inspiration about nature every week. Um, next week, we've got a wonderful talk with Dr. Lawrence Kruger. He's based in the Kruger National Park of South Africa, and he's going to be sharing stories about the relationship between elephants and trees. So we hope you'll join us next week at the same time. Otto, how are you doing? Good, so good. So nice to see so many familiar names in the audience. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. And yeah, hopefully it'll be an interesting ramble. Fantastic. <laughs> Off we go. Cool. So uh, this is not my photograph. I have not had any experience as an astronaut, but um, it's a beautiful image from the moon of planet Earth that we all look, that we all live on. And there are so many stories here, yeah, and I've been so fortunate to um, to experience some of them. And thank you so much, Mike, for pulling some of these out of me. Otherwise, they would have just sat on my on my hard drive. But um, we're going to go to some, yeah, quite a few places around the world. We're going to start off in the Subantarctic and then go around to Chathams and Galapagos and end off in the Cedarberg. But first, we're going to dive into the Prince Edward Islands. Um, and that, these are about two and a half thousand kilometers southeast of Cape Town. And on the bottom there, you have Marion Island. And on the top, you have Prince Edward Island. There is a research station on the on Marion Island, um, but to get there, you need to go on a ship, and it takes you about five days to get down there um, through some really wild seas, and you arrive at this crazy space station. Um, and um, this, yeah, I came down. I went to here in 2011, 12, where I spent a year with. 17 other people, other scientists, and the ship kind of drops you off with all your food and then buggers off back to um, South Africa. And then you left your own devices and you got this crazy place to explore. Um, one of the, the main reasons why I was down here was to um, research the seabirds. Um, and getting around the island was interesting. Um, this is the interior during the middle of winter, and this is not snow, this is ice. So most of the time you walk around in these gumboots because it's really wet and marshy, but here you have to strap the, we found these old crusty, rusty crampons that we tied to the bottom of our gumboots and we had ice picks and such new newbies, but um, yeah, they, they worked really nicely and just these beautiful landscapes um, in the interior. So this is middle of winter um, and you walk past these crazy features of ice, ice blown features um, on this volcanic um, black lava. Um, yeah, so, so Marion is a volcanic island. Um, it's quite a young island. It's about half a million years old. And you can see this red scoria in the bottom section and covered in this low growing vegetation all the way down to the coast. And then this coastline is just so rugged. These, these fingers of black lava that poke out. And it's very difficult for a lot of animals to access these shores, but the rock hoppers um, find it quite easy, actually. Um, although very aptly named, being rock hoppers. And they kind of make their way up and they find these nooks and crannies to, to breed in. Um, and yeah, they, they were definitely one of my favorite species on the islands. Um, on the, and them together with, yeah, so, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, but basically, Mike, if you could go to the next one. Thanks. Um, yeah, just these, you can see these beautiful volcanic cliffs with this like, um, Cochula plumosa, this um, um, salt-tolerant vegetation along the edges. Um, and 
it was mainly the rock hoppers um, that I was studying during this year, but also the macaroni penguins. Um, and they, they differ to the rock hoppers because they've got this more like sleek Italian mobster kind of hairdo, whereas the rock hoppers are more like these punk rocker um, penguins. And, and they're both crested penguins. And there's actually, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of crested penguins out there. I think there's eight species um, out of the 18 total penguin species. Um, but one of the most amazing things about living on this island, um, I'm sure a lot of you have your regular walking routes where you head up the mountain and you see seasonal changes, like the ericas of this erica is flowering now and then next month you'll go back and there'll be another erica flowering. But on Marion, what it, it's just so in your face um, for the whole winter, the penguins aren't there, the macaroni and the rock upper penguins. Um, but then there are these massive blooms and then the penguins, uh, so in, in the springtime, and then these penguins start arriving back en masse. And this is a, a, a beautiful um, colony on the west coast called Am the Amphitheater. And just to see all these penguins roll in and all of a sudden there's just like sounds and smells and they all start um, checking each other out and then they mate and um, they start laying eggs and um, they tend to their nests and they build their nests out of all sorts of things like pebbles and just little sandy holes, but also bones of other penguins so it's um yeah that was really that was really interesting to see like whatever is useful in the sub Antarctica, okay you just gotta just gotta use what you what you have and also um, how, how did the penguins get up to those ledges from from one ledge to the other sorry i just want to go go back one yeah go for it um yeah, it's really impressive. Hey, um, the macaronis are less capable of of doing it. Um, they're a bit larger and less agile, but the rock hoppers they just have a spring in their step. They can they can leap, um, and they basically the waves crash into the cliffs and they just like almost come flying out of the foam. It's yeah, it's quite quite impressive to to see. Um, and so, yeah, watching these macaronis, like watching the seasons change and watch it, watching them come ashore and lay the eggs and, and then these eggs hatch into chicks and seeing those bonds form. And also individual penguins, because I had study sites and I went back and I saw the same penguins, I saw how they were doing. Um, and then these, these chicks grow big very quickly so that's after about three weeks the the parents are still um yeah still giving it lots and lots of food um and part of my yeah th there's there's a lot of penguins and because there are a lot of penguins they need a lot of food um but unfortunately they due to unknown reasons um, the penguins, both the macaroni and rock up penguins have been declining in the last um, two to three decades. So part of the reason why I was on the island was to study, study them um, toward, and study them towards my, my PhD. And um, all good, Mike? Yep, 100%. Yeah, have you got any questions? Okay, cool. Just rambling along here. No, no, I'm um, enjoying it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, so, so the biggest question was, where do these penguins go to find food, and 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 how do they do it? Because previously, that wasn't known. Um, we knew that they were declining, but it wasn't known exactly what was going on. So first, you got to know like where do they go to find food. And so use these little GPS and temperature depth recorders 
which packaged up neatly um, and then used some Tessa tape, really strong German sticky tape to um, weave it into the feathers and give the penguins a little backpack. Um, and I remember the first deployments that I did um, arrived on the island, like I had 10 of these devices for the whole breeding season. And I put five out on these penguins, on these macaroni penguins to accompany them on the incubation trips. And I didn't know how long they were gonna be. They could be between like two to three to four weeks. And yeah, that was a very stressful time because after 30 days, I hadn't had one penguin come back with a device. So I was like, oh, that's sacrificial, five devices gone. But they all came back. Um, just yeah, very long trips, stocking up for the breeding season ahead. Um, but thereafter, once the chicks hatch, their trips are really, really, really short. Um, this is an example of a rock hopper penguin that did a single foraging trip in a day had traveled 25 k's out to sea to these deeper waters. The water drops away very deep here. So, so where it was foraging there was probably um, between one and a half to 3,000 meters. Um, and basically what you can see is you can see where the penguin is spending a lot of time. So red on your screen there is, is a lot of time and purple is a very short amount of time. So it's traveling offshore to these deeper waters and spending a lot of time there. And if we zoom in a little closer, you can see that area in some more detail. And, um, but this is just what's happening from a bird's eye view. I mean, these, they're penguins, they dive underwater, they feed on things underwater. So um, with the diving data, it kind of gives you this um, two dimensional profile um, because yeah, their food is mostly way it's um yeah way underwater um um mike if you could go to the next one yeah so so they're they're diving on these into these shoals of 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 krill of fish and um you can see at the bottom they do these kind of foraging wiggles and these are classic foraging dives um and what is really interesting between the two species the macaronis and the rock hoppers um, most of them dive to about 40 to 60 meters. Um, but the macaronis being larger and having larger lungs, um, I might, if we could just go, go back one, um, um, the having larger lungs, um, they're able to hold more oxygen and more air and they're able to dive longer and deeper. So we saw that when there was when there were years of um, reduced krill availability, um, they actually dived deeper and fed on more fish, more mctophid fish, which are rich energy energy dense fish. But the rock hoppers they also dived a little bit deeper, but they couldn't dive as deep as the macaronis could to get that energy dense fish. And they actually fed on less energy dense um, notothenids. Um, and so there's a big difference between how these species um, uh, interact with their environment when there's lots of food versus very little food. And actually the rock hoppers are in faster decline than the macaronis. And that could be one of the reasons, but these birds are working hard to get their food. So if we go to the next one, this is a day in the life of a rock hopper penguin trying to find food to feed its chick. This isn't going to pick and pay or spa to suddenly jack in and, and get your trolley full of goods and you back home within an hour. This is a whole day out there. And you can look on the left there, you, you can see the depth and it, goes from 20 to 80 meters. And I mean, some of these dives are going to 100 meters. Um, and actually they dive even deeper, but just look at all those dives like between 60 and 80 meters in the middle of the day. Um, 
And so they actually spend 68% of their time diving deep. And so they're working, they're working really, really hard to get their food. Huh. Um, That's really deep. <laughs> but it wasn't just penguins yeah. that you were, you were seeing when you were there. Yeah, so these guys, oh, the wandering albatrosses were also, um, also incredible. I mean, and they also work really, really, really hard to get their food. Um, but it was also amazing to see them change throughout the year. Um, Cause same thing, visited, walked many of these routes and saw the same albatrosses. Um, and something that you don't get from pictures often is the sense of scale. And these are huge birds. Um, and yeah, I can never get over it. But basically, they, they only breed every two years. Um, and they spend the, the, the whole one single breeding season is usually about like 14 months. Um, and then they skip, they skip a year. And then they come back after not having seen their partner for so long and then they kind of do this rekindling dance so these wandering albatrosses they dance around each other to kind of um secure their bond it's like going going on a hike with your lover or or i don't know singing a random song that you both like together just you know that reminder of something special that you both possess that connects you and they do this, they rotate around each other and they do these like bubble clicks. And it sort of sounds a bit like um, and it's really, really amazing to see. Then after that, they 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 do their thing, they they mate, um, and and then they take turns incubating the eggs on with the single egg, they lay a single egg um, beneath the subantarctic sky. And whilst they're doing this, they kind of tend to the nest and they build it up because um, it helps keep the, the, the egg and the chick dry. Um, and after about two months, the, the chick hatches and then they, they take turns going out to sea to find food. And they can see a little chick on the nest with one of its parents guarding it. And this one just came back for a quick feed and, and then after it fed, it came and checked me out. Um, and then, but then they reach a stage where um, both parents go to sea. Um, and, and these albatrosses, they are incredible flyers. I mean, I can imagine um, everyone who's gone out on a pelagic trip off of Cape Town can attest to, yeah, if you've seen the wandering albatross, it's, it's, it's a special, special thing. Um, although you need to do, you do need to go quite, quite far down, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and they, they work really hard to, to find food for, for their chicks. Um, so, but they, they're, it's okay for them to leave their chicks um, by themselves. Um, and they do so for about um, eight to 10 months, um, eight to nine months, I think, somewhere around there. But uh, their chicks have got these big woolly coats, um, lots of down to help them withstand um, the, the freezing conditions during winter. Um, but, there are some things that they don't have protection against. Um, I mean, they've endured winters. It's ingrained into their evolutionary his history, but um, invasive introduced creatures are not. And, and for those of you who are sensitive um, and don't want to see something gruesome, just like turn away now. Um, I'll give you a few seconds. <laughs> Um, but basically, they're, they're in real trouble. Um, introduced mice have started climbing onto these chicks and scalping them. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting worse and worse with climate change. So basically, nights are getting warmer. There's um, less moisture in the air um, um, at night. So these mice, which for forage at night, are... are 
more able to go outside and feed at night more often because there's less nights with moist, cold air. Um, and Otto, so that, Otto, how bad is it in, in uh, Marion Island? Uh, how many albatrosses are being lost uh, at a rough sort of calculation? What sort of percentage are we talking about? So in, in like from about 2000 to 2009, I think they found um, about le less than 1% of the albatrosses were affected. Um, but in more recent years, um, it's gone to about 5% um, that, that they're finding have nibbles. Not all of them result in death, but um, quite a lot of them do die um, with in a few days, especially that last one that you saw, that one would have definitely died. Um, but yeah, thankfully it's it's not as bad as it is on, on Gough Island in the South Atlantic, where sometimes you know breeding failure can can go up to like 90% of chicks, I believe. Um, so Gough is an example of of a place that Marion could end up being like that if something's not done. Um, this is a sign of hope right here. This is a young albatross chick that has lost all, all of its down. You can still see a little bit on its chest, but um, basically what a lot of people don't know is wandering albatrosses aren't always pure white. Wandering albatrosses actually become whiter as they get older. Um, and so this one you can see is really, really dark. Um, but there's good news on the horizon. Um, there's, oh yeah, I, ju I just wanted to add that, that um, wandering albatrosses aren't the only species that are affected by the mice on Marion. Um, there's also a lot of burrowing petrels and a lot of other albatross species like this sooty albatross. Here it is um, regurgitating a giant piece of um, squid for its chick. Um, but yeah, there's, there's plans underway to remove mice from Marion. Um, it's going to be very, very challenging, but there's a big fundraising effort um, um, that being done by BirdLife South Africa and um, Department of Environmental Affairs and the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology um, um, through the Mouse Free Marion Initiative. And later on at the end, I think we'll, we'll include a link if you're keen to check some of that out. Thanks, Arthur. Cool. Um, it was really nice. Yeah, yeah. Go for it, Mike. No, no. Sorry, I'm just sorry. asking. I'm just asking that. Uh, I mean, to spend twelve months in one place is incredibly special. The other places we're visiting tonight, you went on sort of a a, a shorter time period. Uh, is that why Marion has a special place in your heart, and uh, you're able to see all the seasons changing? Hundred percent. Um, I think there's so many of us who have these really life-changing experiences in wild places. And the longer you spend in a place, I think the more it ingrains itself into your being. Um, but yeah, Marion has been the most profound experience of my life. And I think it will continue to, to, to be so. But yeah, there's also incredible places that have been to... Um, like Nightingale Island. Um, and I was lucky enough to go there for three weeks. Um, uh, Peter Ryan sent me there to um, help Anche Steinfurth set up a rock hopper study colony. And yeah, it's, it's a wild place. Um, in 2011, there was a big oil spill here. Um, it was a ship called the MS Olivia, which was carrying soybeans that ran aground and spilt all of its oil into the surrounding waters. and, and there were a lot of yeah, penguins that were um, afflicted by that, that spill. And, and that's kind of re the reason why we went there was to, to find out more. But um, it's a seabird haven. I mean, there's like these tussock, this, these tussock grass stands um, where there's burrowing petrels and a whole bunch of other seabirds that, that, that breed here. And then in, in, on the right there, you can see a phylica tree um, quite a young one, and, and they have these like fleshy berries, um, and these are these create these beautiful subantarctic forests. I mean, it's the, it's like being in a fairy tale. Um, but these berries 
have um, a very interesting um, predator. Uh, so this is the um, Wilkins bunting. And it's one of the rarest birds in the world. Um, there are less than 85, there are about 85 pairs on the island. Um, and it, they've got an interesting story. Um, uh, they've evolved to have this like really big bill um, that helps them chew through these fleshy, um, I just saw a question, where is Nightingale Island? It's in the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, it's about six days to the west of, um, yeah, of Cape Town. And you can visit there if you want, um, although it's quite difficult. Um, but back to the Wilkins bunting. So, I mean, it's a gargantuan little, um, a, gargant a gargantuan little, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but a gargantuan bill. And um, they've evolved in this place alongside um, another bunting, the nightingale bunting, um, which has a much smaller bill. And it's believed that um, they've kind of, they both come from a common ancestor and they've likely come to the island or, or, or been um, like arrived there as vagrants um, throughout evolutionary history at different periods and kind of occupied different niches. Um, and yeah, so the, the locals call this the big canary and then the, the nightingale bunting they call the, the, the little canary. Um, yeah, so if we go over to the little, yeah, I love this shot. It's got such attitude. Um, and you can see uh, it's got a little, some bling down at the bottom. There's a little metal ring. Um, there were, I, was, I helped um, two researchers, um, Dominic Rollinson and Heinz Ortmann, um, to, to help ban some of these birds so they could better understand um, their dynamics and population sizes and activities around the island. Um, but yeah, this is that, that was a story from the heart of the island. Um, I think it's about time to get back to penguins. It's been too long now since I've spoken about penguins. <laughs> so these, this, <laughs> um, this is a northern rock of a penguin. So they've got these longer crest feathers and it's, it's looking a lot like Gollum there as it crawled out of the icy um, subantarctic, but um, spent a lot of time sitting on the shore and watching these northern rock of penguins as they arrived back after six months, sorry, four months at sea. Um, and they are so chilled um, and they allow you to get really, really close. And so snapped some interesting portraits of them lying in the rock on the sun, in the sun. And I mean, just how's that hairdo, hey, like rock stars. <laughs> If if I could, I, I would probably try out something like that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but what was fascinating for me um, was what we found on the penguins. Um, and that was goose barnacles. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen these attached to objects as you stroll along the beach. Um, they live a very pelagic existence out at sea. Um, but then wash ashore every now and then. Um, but I did my honors project on these along the South African coast. And I had read, I'd only read one instance um, or record of a goose barnacle attaching to a penguin. So this was very exciting because we started seeing so many. Um, and so we collected some of these. And if you look at the shell structure here, you can imagine like, so how these work is there's a little larvae, crustacean larvae, these are crustaceans, um, they're not mollusks. Um, and it attaches, it's floating around in the Southern Ocean, it attaches to a penguin, because um, floating objects in the Southern Ocean are very rare. And then it starts growing, and it starts developing its shell, and it develops its shell from the water around it. And because of chemistry, 
what it basically does is it stores the qualities of its environment. And using back calculations and biogeochemistry, you can look at the oxygen isotopes in the shell of these goose barnacles to infer what water temperature the shells formed in. So you can essentially use it to see where the penguins were foraging or in what water temperatures the penguins were foraging before they arrived back to the island. So I know this is quite overwhelming for a lot of people. Let's start off with the colors. Um, it's all sea surface temperature, red being hot, um, blue being cold. It goes from about 20 degrees to about two degrees. It's super purple. And let's start at Nightingale Island. Um, so just below Nightingale Island, you can see like a light gray band, um, two light gray bands. And, and that is the, the, the predicted foraging area according to the, the temperature of the goose barnacles that we found attached to them. So that's, you can, you can basically say that that's where they were spent the last month or two um, before they arrived back. But what was cool was that we also spoke to um, researchers at Gough Island, which is 300 kilometers to the southeast, and they also saw goose barnacles attached to penguins, um, to rock of penguins. And so they collected goose barnacles there. And um, anyway, and then so we compared the two, and basically by analyzing the goose barnacles attached to the penguins, we could infer that the penguins are foraging in different parts of the South Atlantic Ocean from two different populations, which was some super sexy science. <laughs> Amazing. Not, not published yet though, working on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this is an example of the hut. Um, it's actually a holiday house that the, the um, people at Tristan de Kuna, um, which is just across the way, um, use, use every now and then when they feel like escaping their island. Um, and we, there were some interesting inhabitants. This is a broad-billed prion. You can see it's, it's big build there. And they, they mostly come out um, in the, at night and during the day, they're either out at sea or in their burrows. Um, and yeah, the, the, just another interesting example. And I'm sure this will get um, most birders' um, hearts pumping. This is a, a Tristan thrush. And while it may look like an innocent um, garden bird, it's actually quite sneaky. These guys are known to drink the blood of penguins, known to um, crack open eggs, and they're even known to kill storm petrels. Um, but they very often scavenge on, on flesh um, of prions killed by skewers. But they feed this to their own young and hence giving them life. Um, this was so cool to find this nest. Um, it's amazing being on these islands because these animals are not afraid of people. So they let you Although weary at first, they let you come very close. And if you're respectful and you just don't make any sudden movements, they'll just carry on doing what they would normally do. So I watched this um, thrush um, feeding its, its chick, or the starchy, as the locals call it. Um, and yeah, that was something really special about Nightingale. Um, but also getting really close to the um, yellow-nosed albatrosses. Yeah, I'm with my, my dreadlocks back in 2012, um, saying how's it to um, an Atlantic yellow-nosed albatross in Phylica forest, there you get a better idea of, of yeah, it's just like living in a fairy tale. Um, and they scattered, they breed scattered throughout the island. Um, and it's just, it's so striking, like their the facial, markings most albatrosses are but these guys they look like they've got a professional makeup crew <laughs> they wake up and where's the eyeshadow where's the lipstick yeah um and you can see these little um i've forgotten what they're called these gapes 
but um, here it is looking at me, sitting up on its nest, kind of going, hey, just watch yourself, don't get too close. And it's, they do it to each other, it's a show of, it's a, it's a warning display. Um, it's, they're a little bit covered by their feathers, but these go like bright orange if they really get them going. It's inspiration for your moustache. Oh uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. One day, one day I'll dye it orange after the Atlantic yellow nose double trusses. <laughs> um, yeah, and just ah, oh, this is an example of the bug ferns on top of Tristan de Kuna, and it's also Atlantic yellow nose double trusses breeding in between these bug ferns, and there you see one flying off in the distance, and I mean. Even though these birds are on this little island in the South Atlantic Ocean, they travel far. Um, and they actually, they forage along the coast of South Africa and into Namibia, and are actually really impacted by South Africa's fishing vessels. So nothing's isolated in the ocean. And this is bycatch from um, South, Af South African longliners. Um, and most of these are shy albatrosses, um, but there you can see a yellow-nosed albatross um, at the top with the hook still in its beak. You have a few white and petrels. And um, this, this um, featured, um, this was, we put together with uh, Thomas Peshak with the help of Peter Ryan. Um, and featured in, in National Geographic magazine, which was amazing to get that kind of exposure um, for, these, for, the, for what's happening. But what's amazing is the work that BirdLife South Africa and the Albatross Task Force have done. Um, that is a, a, a trawling vessel, but um, which also has um, bycatch, but um, due to new regulations, and fishing practices like when to set your nets, setting them at night, using things like hook pods and tory lines, and bird scaring lines to keep the birds away. Um, yeah, these efforts have dramatically decreased um, by catch of all kinds of seabirds on the South African coastline. So that's a big conservation win um, because of bird life South Africa. That's a really good, good news story. Going from one to the next good news story <laughs> of, of another group of very passionate conservationists. Where are we here? So the Chatham Islands. Um, they're about 800 kilometers east of uh, New Zealand. And I was lucky enough to travel here with Thomas Peshak um, as part of his global story on seabirds. And I mean, Oh, what a rock, what a place. This is a snapshot of the pyramid where these Chatham albatrosses breed. 5,000 pairs breed on the single rock and nowhere else on the planet. That's it, that's their entire home. And the nests are kind of scattered all along the sides and in that cave there. And that cave is like a holy grail. Um, it's it's yeah it's it's just such an incredible place um and the there you can see the nests i mean i've seen some albatross nests in my life and these are by far the tallest um these incredible incredible pedestals um and basically they're in most places these albatross nests are exposed to the wind and the rain. But here, because of the protection offered by uh, the cave, they're not eroded as much. And therefore the guano and um, yeah, everything just builds up year after year after year. Um, um, but what's really sad is, I mean, when you have all your eggs in one basket or on one rock, um, you are actually, as a species, very vulnerable to any changes, especially given um, all the changes happening due to climate, yeah, climate driven changes, like one of them being increased intensity of rainfall events. If you imagine 
you're not in the cave, you're on the outside. There's a heavy rainfall coming down. It's very easy for that rain to undercut your nest, for the nest to dislodge and fall down the slope and into the sea. Um, also big storms, they come through and the spray and the waves go really, really high. So these are, they're quite literally sitting ducks. So there's a local, so we went there with a local crew of, I mean, look at those birds, they're beautiful. Um, such an amazing contrast between the, the oranges and, and the greys. Um, so we spent the night on this rock um, it was very difficult to get ashore. Um, and the main reason we were there was with this really passionate group of human beings from the Chatham Tycho Trust, who are doing this translocation project where they are making a new colony of, of Chatham Island albatrosses. So there we have Pyramid in the, in the distance and there's Mike. And in each one of these white boxes is a Chatham Island Tycho check. So every year for the last six years, five years, sorry, they've um, taken around about 60 chicks and they make sure to, to do it as quick as possible. They keep them nice and cool um, and they, we, they transport them to the nearby Chatham Island um, where they've created a new um, temporary, well, a new colony. So a big problem on Chatham Island is that they are sheep, they are invasive cats, they are all sorts of other invasive rodents, possums. So they created this predator-proof fence um, around a place called Point Gap. And they have basically put these chicks on these little flower pots in between these decoys and they play sounds of, so it sounds like it's on the pyramid. And it's so funny because these chicks will get up off their pots and go over to those adults and they will beg for food. So they believe that those, those um, decoys are actually are actual birds. Um, and so much so that it wears the paint down on the decoys and they have to repaint them. But um, during these last two months that the chicks take until they um, have until they fledge, the, um, this passionate group uh, of, of conservationists feeds the chicks um, with squid and, and sardines. Um, and then hopefully when these birds fledge and leave, um, it has a massive impact on where they will return. And um, there's a word called natal phylopatry. So it's like where you're born, you will most likely return to. And it differs between different species, but in albatrosses, it's generally um, quite strong. But this is all still an experiment. And in the next couple of years, we will find out to see if these birds that have fledged over the last five years will, will return and start breeding here because they only do so after about five to seven years. So they haven't come back yet. I actually I went and had a look at the the um, the Instagram page and they have updates and they've found some of the first batch of males have actually been spotted on the pyramid, so not at this colony, but they think that maybe the males are more likely to just follow other birds. Um, and come back to scout earlier than females. Huh. So um, translocation um, projects have been very successful in a wide range of, of, of seabirds, including Lambert's Bay up the west coast with gannets. Um, and yeah, we'll see how, how this one pans out, but hopefully there'll be a second colony of Chatham Island albatrosses. Um, so that's the accommodation uh, on the bottom there for this dedicated team at the Chatham Tycho Trust. And behind them is the last remaining tract of forest on the Chatham Islands, because it's mostly um, people have been farming sheep and cattle. And um, one farmers, uh, um, Bruce and Liz Tuanui, Tuanui have decided to 
protect this last patch of forest. And it's, it's insane. It's beautiful going through here. But it's also the last place you'd think to find a seabird. Um, and this is home, this forest is home to a very elusive um, bird called the taiko, Chatham Island taiko. And taiko in, in Moriori means um, a digger from the sea. Um, and in some places, it's quite um, a generic term applied to burrowing petrels. Um, but it's also got another name called the magenta petrel. And it was first described in the 1700s, I think, um, but then wasn't seen again until a dedicated group of amateur ornithologists decided and they had a hunch that they were going to go down to, um, excuse me, to the Chathams to look for it. And they did, they found a few birds. But this, these birds are even rarer than, than the Wilkins buntings. Um, basically, there are less than 100 individuals that are known. Um, and yeah, it, it presents a huge conservation challenge. But they do this, I just want to go into this really interesting thing that they do. I mean, living in the forest, you know, most seabirds have breathing these wide open areas and they can run and take off. But you can't do that if you're living in a dense, jungly forest. So what they do is that they climb trees and at night. So all of this is, these are images from camera trap footage um, from the Chatham Tycho Trust. Um, and, and then they take off from these trees. Um, and it was really hard and we didn't have enough time to focus on um, filming and photographing. Um, this was again with, still with Thomas Peshak. Um, uh, these birds, but there was an amazing um, artist who was with us called, um, her name's Abby McBride. And in a few days, she sketched out this beautiful story of how these Chatham, how these Tycos, you know, sitting at the burrow, then they climb up a tree and you can see the stars and they spread their wings and then they leap and they fly out to sea. Um, so really interesting seabirds. Um, they definitely opened up a whole new world of, of seabirds to me. And Otto, are but, they also in trouble with them, with the cats or possums or, or rats? Because um, they're not behind that same fence line as the other birds. No, yeah, they're extremely vulnerable. I mean, yeah, there's all of those cats, possums, um, three types, three diff different species of invasive rat. Um, and they eat the eggs, they eat the chicks. And I mean, with less than a nine, 90, sorry, less than a hundred birds. I mean, that's your breeding population. You're in, you're in trouble. So um, yeah, these, these guys have their work cut out for them and they've come up with a very, very nifty way to try and improve the situation. Um, so I followed, I went for lots of walks with um, um, Dave and uh, through the forest and he showed me these really nifty, um, so if you look at this through the leaves and you see that little red light shining there, that is a little light, a receiver outside the burrow entrance. And you can see a dark hole there and that's the, the burrow entrance. And basically each of these birds, they have to understand where the bird comes from, who it's related to, how often it's there, who it's breeding with. So they insert these tiny, tiny little pit tags. It's like a grain of rice, just putting a little grain of rice under the skin and it has an ID. Every time that bird goes through that entrance or out, it logs it. And all Dave has to do I mean, he walks so much every single day. So he has to walk up to it, log into his app, and he downloads the activity data of that petrol. And if he sees that um, a bird, a taiko and its closely related sister or brother are starting to pair up, he'll separate them. He'll wait for them, and he'll try to get in there, and he'll separate them. Because if you have a brother and a sister breeding, that chick does not survive. 
So it's a wasted breeding season. So they are playing matchmaker, but you have to do at this stage because otherwise they'll all be inbreeding and they won't be surviving. Um, and the species won't survive. So it's really intricate. These guys know exactly what they're doing. They've done genetics on every single bird. And once they've got the patagon, there's very little disturbance, um, unless you decide to breed with your brother or sister. Um, but then what they do with the chicks is just before they're about to fledge, similar to the, because um, here they're very exposed in, in this open forest, they're very exposed. Um, similar to the albatross translocation project, they take the chicks to, and this is not all the chicks, this is like, like a few, like, like maybe a handful each season, to a place called Sweetwater, which is also a fenced off part of the forest, um, where they essentially um, have no predators in there. So they can, they can live out that, that next section and that last section of their life, and then they fledge from there, and they've found that tycos who have fledged have started coming back to breed in that in that patch of forest. And, um, and, and these are the same conservationists that are looking after the albatrosses and these birds. Pretty passionate. And they're, and they're reforesting the coastal um, tree. Like, oh, it's amazing what they're doing. Um, Mike, I'm still on Dave's um, photo. So yeah, that just gives you um, a shot of Sweetwater. Um, I mean, it's tiny, but that place can support, you know, like hundreds of birds. There's enough breeding area for that. But in that entire patch of forest behind, they are continually trying to find new individuals that come and breed there. And also they're walking the perimeter of that and trapping for cats and mice. And it's, it's really amazing conservation work. Hmm. And now we move away from birds. I know we, we're running short of time, but uh, stick with us because we've got two more to go. Cool, what are we on? We're on, what's the time? Oh my gosh, five minutes left, no ways. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> too much of a ramble. Okay, so right now we are in um, the Galapagos on uh, Alcedo vol Volcano. And I, I um, came here in 2016 again with Thomas Peshak and uh, Steve Benjamin. Um, hopefully you would have heard some of Steve's stories last week. And um, this place is off limits to tourists. So we were very lucky to visit. And this particular crater, it's a volcano, um, is home to 5,000 giant tortoises. So this is the densest um, location in the world to, to see giant tortoises. And that's our little hut on the crater rim that we're staying at. But our main focus was on the tortoises that were in the crater. Um, so during, during the rainy season, it rains and you get these pools forming in the crater. And a lot of the tortoises will come down into the crater to, to drink and to feed. The, the grass doesn't look too lush here, but generally it's quite lush. Um, and there you can see a fumarole in the background. I mean, this is still very active. Um, this fumarole, so it's like it spews sulfur, all these little yellow bits um, um, are sulfur. And when the day ends, these tortoises aggregate in these pools um, and uh, I, I, we, we slept a night here listening to the rumblings of the volcano beneath us and I love this shot. Um, a moth, this is a long exposure and a moth flew into the frame and it created this perfect spiral and I couldn't believe it when I looked at that image on, my, on, on the back of my camera. It's just like wow, what a cool pattern. Um, but these tortoises have a bit of a problem um, during the dry season um, and where the surrounding water is quite cold um, and the air temperature is really hot, but there's no rainfall in the crater, so therefore nothing to eat. So, but there is something, there's this fog that forms called a garua. And the fog rolls in and as it comes over the crater rim, 
the moist air condenses on the mosses and um, the ferns on the trees and the, the water drips down these trees into these pools and that sustains the tortoises um, s for sustains tortoises um, through the through the dry um, the dry season very cool experience to be here but they they haven't had it always easy the the trees they they've been hammered in the past yeah so another case of invasive species to ruin the day um, there used to be goats and donkeys, even not very many, but lots of goats. And as you know, goats eat everything. So they started eating away at these trees and all the vegetation. And basically then these drip pools were not functioning as drip pools and the tortoises were then not able to get water throughout the, the dry season. Um, but through a very nifty, um, eradication program they were able to get rid of the goats and did they use a special technique uh, you mentioned something about a Judas goat before when we were chatting <laughs> yeah so I mean uh, the the first like thousand goats that you you kill because this is a large volcano a crater um, yeah and as for the goats yeah wrong place wrong time um, it's quite unfortunate but they just have to get rid of them. Um, and basically the first, the first bunch of goats you can um, find and, and, and remove, they, they used helicopters to shoot a lot of these, these goats from the air. And, but then when it got down to like a handful, what they used is they, they, they shot all the males and then they put um, a collar, a tracking collar around the females. And when they would go into heat, all the males would follow them. And so shame, these female goats would just have these male goats dropping dead around them until there were none left and then they were removed. But um, it's a tricky one um, when, yeah, when animals have been introduced and they're affecting the natural e ecological status quo of a system mm. and you have to make the hard, des hard decision and return back to normal. If mm. humans stuff it up, you have to have to correct it. And we are almost out of time, but we're going to quickly go back home to the Cedarberg. Yes, back to the Cedarberg, which has recently had so many, so much nice rain. Um, hopefully you'll all recognize this. This is the uh, Maltese Cross. And we all love the Cedarberg because of its amazing mountains and just wide open spaces and space to think. And it's such a wide, um, yeah, such an amazing place and extends all the way up to, this is the Urlachskloof, just to the, in the northern part of the greater Cedarberg region. But what we don't often do is dip our heads below water into the rivers. And I've been working with a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Jeremy Shelton, who took this image to tell some stories about some unknown freshwater fish um, in this part of the world the sandfish, the Clan William sandfish. And so, um, yeah, uh, I think is the next slide, you can go to the next one. So we're, here's the during, just to give you um, a, a, yeah, a place, put them into place. And these sandfish used to occur in the olifants, but they are now only, they now only occur in the during. And in 2013, there was a survey done of this river by Bruce Paxton, and they only found 50 adult sandfish. So that's likely not all of them, but it, it sure is like, you know, an indication of how, how the species is on, is on the brink of extinction. Um, and yeah, this is an example of one of those adults um, it's, it's just this beautiful big fish um, and yeah it's it's the, we we also spoke to a lot of locals to so well we didn't speak to the sand but um, they have left paintings of fish in the Cedarberg um, and 
So this is a migratory species, the Clan William sandfish, and they, they would have moved up and down these rivers for thousands and thousands of years, and they obviously imprinted on, on the sand. But more recently, we spoke to um, people who have lived in these valleys for a while, and this is Sarah Fransman. And Sarah was telling us stories about, oh, she was so animated, um, just how these like thousands and thousands of fish would move up these rivers and you would hear them and they would go from bank to bank and they would be lying on top of each other and it, it would look like there was no water in the river because it was just fish. And what they do is they make their way up these tributaries. Um, this is the Bido River Valley. And then they, they twist and they turn and she was describing to us how they spawn and then the eggs come up and then their little fry start to emerge and the little juvenile fish come out and they start feeding with their little undermouths on the rocks. Um, um, basically, she just doesn't see this anymore. I mean, these young, tiny fish are, are really, really, really under threat. Um, so, yeah, part of the reason for, for this is um, there's it's twofold. One, these rivers are seasonal. They run, they naturally flow during the wet season and then they dry during the dry season. But now because of climate change, because there's been less water, this, these flows are, are not um, persisting long enough and these pools that sustain the sandfish during this time are drying up, especially in, mainly in the tributaries. But also they're being confined to these little pools with introduced fish. Here we are, invasive species again. Um, such a, and especially the um, spotted bass. And this is a bluegill sunfish. I mean, your eyes go straight to this bluegill sunfish. And these we caught in the, in the Bido River. But what is very hard to see there, if you look down towards the bottom, you can see a tiny little sandfish. And I mean, these tiny sandfish stand no chance. So these alien fish are just gobbling their way through these sandfish populations. And what we're left with is an aging population of sandfish that can't reproduce. So the entire life cycle is completely severed. It's broken. And if nothing's done, they're gonna go extinct. Um, so we've started this conservation project um, uh, so many collaborators on this. Um, yeah, here you got Ceci and Mo and Leonard and Bruce and Jem all putting this fike net or this trick net to try and catch these tiny little sandfish um, uh, in, a, in November last year. And we caught 600 of these tiny fish and we relocated them to part of a river where there are no um, alien fish so that they can at least um, uh, have a bit of time to grow to a larger size and to be able to escape the jaws of alien fish. But what we're also doing and um, what we started doing is clearing two dams and working with landowners. I mean this is such a beautiful project because the people in the Bilo Valley are, are we've met the most amazing people and they are like yes use our dams as nurseries and they're all on board. And um, basically we first need to remove the alien fish like the carp and the bluegill um, sunfish from these dams. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Mike, could, yeah, there we go, cool. And so this is from an alien fish removal that we did. And now we're gonna go back and check that there's no alien fish in here. And then we're gonna turn it into, this is on Mertonoff farm, it's Barry, in the middle um, and he's really keen to make it a sandfish sanctuary. So basically these sandfish, they, they feed on algae. So we make sure that there's enough rocks. It's got, it's spring fed. So there's cool water that always comes in. Um, and then after two years, we'll release those fish into the during and then they can then get to a size that they themselves can reproduce and, and start the next generation. But there's a long way to go and we're working with Ape Nature and a whole bunch of people. And we've just recently released 
an exciting web series called Saving Sandfish um, because personally, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I've never seen an adult sandfish in my life. Um, but I'm head over heels in love with this project um, and because of all the passionate people involved in it. And um, we worked with Tegan Phillips to develop a character for the sandfish. It's called an ornabeck because they have this undermouth and they feed on algae on the bottom. Um, and yeah, so there's a little bit of animation in the series. There's myself and my moustache. So now I have to keep it because <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> and that's Jam on the right and Ornabek in the middle. Um, yeah, so if you head over to YouTube and, and type in Saving Sandfish, you should be able to um, give it a watch. Let us know what you think. So thanks a million. That was really, really great. Um, so what, what do we have on, on, on the screen now? How do people, uh, can you just talk through that? So uh, while I look at some of the questions, if you have more, uh, please won't you um, put them in the Q&A for us? Uh, I've got a couple for Otto myself. Cool. Okay, so just quickly, there's website, Instagram, etc. But all of the amazing projects that I've talked about, um, the first one on Marion, mousefreemarion.org, definitely go have a look at the website. It's a very important cause. Um, I myself have donated. You can sponsor a hectare of Marion to um, help fund the eradication process to remove mice from the island. Um, that's still, planning is still underway. Hopefully that'll get done in 2023. But otherwise, if you're interested in Nightingale Island and supporting um, conservation there, you can actually go to Nightingale Island yourself. Um, although it's quite, it's quite an adventure, a visit on um, the Tristan de Kuna website. And if you want to um, check out the, the amazing conservation work in New Zealand by the guys at Chatham Tycho Trust, that's the, the website over there. And yeah, if you're keen to hear more, um, about Saving Sandfish and some other freshwater stories. Um, myself and Jeremy Shelton have started freshwaterfilms.com. Um, yeah, head over there for some freshwater content. Thanks, and, we'll, and Otto will definitely link your first film. It's really great, guys. Uh, I really would recommend you watch it. Um, Otto, do you ever get sort of pessimistic um, about climate change, about going to these places where uh, birds are, you know, are, are endangered? Um, how, how do you feel generally? You've been to places that most of us will never get to and, and seen, you know, 90 of the last, last birds left on earth. Uh, how do you view it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bad news um, in the world, but it's, it's, there's no point, and a lot of people have said this, but there's no point in being pessimistic. Um, it helps absolutely nobody. Um, but also, I mean, the it's I've been so lucky to go to these places and just to see all of these ecosystems um, are yeah intact ecosystems is really inspiring. But also, there are so many people, so many inspiring people doing such amazing work in their backyard. You know, they're not doing it for attention; they're doing it because they're connected to it, um, and that's been that's been really amazing. Um, yeah, I'm so optimistic because that's the only, I mean, sometimes I, yeah, I get a, I get a bit bleak, but then it's just, you know, you gotta, you gotta do what you can and, and be optimistic about it. And for, for the average person, the, most of us live in a small little town here in Hamanis on the tip of Africa. What is your advice to us and, and all of, all of the other people around the world? How do we contribute? Um, how do we, find our purpose yeah i mean well at the southwestern tip of africa i mean this is such a yeah the cradle of humankind um we live in a very special place i mean some fan boss is like 60 million years old um and there's so much history to this place um and there if we tune in there are so many important things that need to be done right in our backyard. Too often we focus our attention overseas or 
we're overwhelmed by everything. But if you just find one little thing, and I, I, Mike, I remember you telling me like how you just got back from clearing aliens, you know, and uh, it's, it's clearing alien vegetation. I mean, I personally find it so satisfying. Every single Roy Kranz that you cut out is, is you know, one, one step forward for human and uh, plant kind. Um, uh, yeah, just get involved in whatever you can and support those that are doing good work. Um, yeah, share stories that you find inspire that are inspiring. Um, because uh, the one thing that I really was impressed by all of your stories is that there was a group of passionate conservationists who were really going above and beyond. Um, and I think we can't rely on governments or uh, civil society has to as you get involved. Um, I'm just quickly reading through these questions here, Otto. Someone said, um, Paul asked, what is the albatross survival rate at, uh, on the Chatham Islands, on the pyramid there? Do you have any idea? Of, of those chicks? Uh, um, yes, of the normal, albatrosses. Yeah, just in a quickly. normal breeding season. Yeah. I'm not actually sure, to be honest. Um, I can imagine it's, it's, it's probably... Um, between 60 and 80%. Um, I think that that's a fairly, but that's a guesstimate. Um, yeah, I wish I wish I knew, yeah. Look, um, I haven't been able to get to a lot of the questions because I've probably got technical challenges on my side, but um, Otto, thanks so much again for spending all the time preparing this. We are definitely going to share your films and I know you've, uh, We've got a lot more adventures coming up, so we hope to check in again in a couple of months. Uh, so thank you, and thank you everyone for spending uh, your time um, uh, watching and being part of this. I remind you again that next week we have uh, Lawrence, uh, and there you see the elephants in the Kruger underneath these giant trees. So it really is a story between two giants, and he's going to be telling us how we manage the elephants, what are the state of the trees, how important are they, so please tune in again uh, next week at the same time. Thanks again, Otto. And um, we will share Otto's details with all of you. Uh, if you have any more questions, um, we'll put you in touch. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, thank you for the amazing opportunity. And uh, yeah, I'm sure Lawrence's talk is going to be incredible. He's such an enthusiastic guy as well. Have a great Thanks evening. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Cheers, Ed. Bye. Cheers.